Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Rob Hunt. I'm the Sustainable Ag Program Manager for NQGI Tropics. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the NQGI Tropics Conversation Series. This is our sixth session in the series, um, and it's titled Counting Every Drop. It's focusing on water quality monitoring in the Lower Burdekin, um, predominantly around cane and other irrigated industries. Um, joining me today, I've got Arwen Rickett from IFMAC, our local, um, well, our local sub-regional NRM organisation. Got Terry Granshaw from SRA, he's the um, district manager for SRA in the Burdekin. And I've got cane grower and cane grower representative, Steve Pillar. Um, so today we're going to be talking mostly about water quality monitoring. Um, the way today is going to work, we've got an hour to um, go through a brief presentation that Arlen's going to lead. And then following that, we're going to have a roundtable conversation about some of the topics that are covered in that presentation and some of the activities that are going on in the Lower Burdekin. I guess the reason for the topic today is that there is a lot of water quality monitoring going on in the Lower Burdekin. It's, it's providing an enormous amount of support and data to the industries um, and it's helping, it's helping project managers, it's helping landholders and it's helping program managers to make better informed decisions. And that's what water quality monitoring really is all about. Um, it's helping us to verify that the act activities that are happening on ground are having meaningful impacts. And as I said, there is a lot of water quality monitoring going on and we're extremely fortunate to have BIFMAC in the Lower Burdekin because BIFMAC has uh, an enormous amount of capability in water quality monitoring. And because they're a well-trusted organisation from growers right through to government, they're able to undertake a lot of that water quality monitoring and really provide a lot of value and make sure that the work that's being done is very well coordinated and it's being well communicated to all of the stakeholders. So I really welcome Owen's attendance here today and, and participating and helping out. Welcome everyone who's joined us. We really appreciate the attendance. It seems like it's a pretty topical conversation. So thanks, Owen. Thanks, Rob. Okay, so... Um... I presume that most people in the audience are probably um, familiar with BIFMAC, but for anyone who's not, um, as Rob said, BIFMAC is a local natural resource management organisation um, based in the Lower Burdekin. Um, and we're a not-for-profit. Um, we're an independent local organisation. We have a long history and expertise in water quality monitoring. Um, we're independent in that we are not-for-profit, so we don't receive any core funding from government or industry groups. We're not industry affiliated in any way. Um, we're entirely project funded. So that's what BIFMAC is, um, and most of the local people know that we've been operating in the um, Burdekin area for quite some time now. I guess um, being a natural resource management organisation, we look after a lot of natural resource management issues, but um, in more recent times, we've really focused on water quality monitoring, and that's where the, the majority of our work now takes place. So the water quality monitoring that we do, um, we do catchment scale monitoring. So that, um, that's an entire sort of larger macro view, I suppose, um, of water quality, um, all the way down to paddock scale monitoring. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the catchment scale monitoring, um, we look after the Burdekin catchment, we look after the Don catchment. Uh, maybe just go back, thanks. Um, we look after Horton catchment, we look after Barada catchment. So there's a lot of catchments there that we look after. Um, and then we do sub catchment monitoring of all the creeks and systems that run into them. And then also more specifically at the micro scale, we do paddock scale monitoring of on-farm trials um, a lot of the time. Owen, oh, you're not actually collecting any samples out in the reef as such, or the lagoon for that matter. That's correct, Terry. So we look after the fresh water uh, side of the catchment. And so where we stop sampling is at the freshwater marine water interface. So where we have the estuary uh, meeting the freshwater interface. So for example, Guru Weir is one of those places where we monitor, but we won't monitor downstream of the weir. Um, so we're really just interested in that freshwater side of things. The marine and estuarine environments are covered by other organisations like James Cook University, um, AIMS, Australian Institute of Marine Science, and Great Barrier Reef uh, Marine Park Authority. So, um, yeah, I guess you're right in that we're not looking at the whole catchment, but we're looking at that freshwater interface, yeah. So why, why water quality monitoring? Um, 
Water quality monitoring from my perspective, I guess my driver um, in particular, and there's obviously a lot of different organisations with different drivers that do water quality monitoring, but from my perspective, um, it's really important to help validate the impact of different farm practices. Um, and whether we do that at the catchment scale and looking at the input of different land uses or whether we do that at the paddock scale and look at specific farming practices, um, to me that's all important um, to validate the impact of those different um, activities. And in particular, I think it's an important decision support tool for growers um, as well. So for some sites, um, water quality data may be used to inform reporting, for example, paddock to reef reporting or reef report cards, um, and also improve modelling specific to the burdekin. So I guess one of the issues um, with those report cards is sometimes they have to use modelling um, to inform them. And we all know um, that modelling is only as good as the data that goes into it. And so it's important that we are constantly feeding in locally relevant um, current data into those models um, that's specific to the burdekin. So that's something as well. Um, not all data that we collect is going to be suitable for those purposes um, and not all growers that work with us will agree for that data to be used in that purpose. But a big driver for me is to make sure that, you know, if there is going to be modelling done, we want to try and make it as accurate as possible. Um, and so it does need to use um, robust local data. I think it's really important you just said too about being transparent as well. The growers completely understand that there's monitoring and why you're monitoring and where that data's going. Usually, you don't have any issues, do you? That's right, exactly right. There's often that fear of the unknown, but once they see the data um, and understand what's going on, there generally is a willingness um, out there from our participating farmers for that information de identified, of course, um, to go into those purposes. And I guess the other point also is that water quality monitoring um, is not just about. DIN, um, dissolved in organic nitrogen and pesticides and chemicals, um, but a big part of what we're doing and increasingly so in one of our um, current projects is about measuring runoff volumes, so surface runoff volumes, because obviously that's, um, you know, the major carrier of those kind of um, um, pollutants, I suppose you could say, um, but also from a farming perspective, um, you know, runoff volume is very important for a number of reasons, which I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later. Next slide, please. I'll just give you a quick sampling equipment overview. Um, a lot of you that operate in the Burdekin will have seen these kind of instruments out there. Um, but depending on what kind of sampling we're doing and whether it's catchment scale, subcatchment scale or paddock scale, we'll use different equipment. Um, so what you'll see there is um, we've got real-time water quality sensors. Those are actually placed into a water body um, in situ and they take regular reading of certain parameters and we can set them to take a reading every 10 minutes or every half hour or hour. Um, we have Sandemus flumes and pipe loggers. These are specifically for measuring the surface runoff. Um, they're placed within furrows within the farm. Um, we also use grab poles um, for some of the natural streams where we might just be wanting to take one sample at a point in time. And obviously, being in crop country, we need to try to get away as, as far away as possible from the water source sometimes. But we also need to make sure we don't contaminate those samples, and therefore the grab pole is quite important there um, because um, your skin also can contaminate water samples. And then we have auto samplers, and there's a photo there of Dennis. A lot of the locals are familiar with seeing Dennis running around with these auto samplers. There's, there's different types of auto samplers with different um, price tags associated with them and also levels of um, rigour, I suppose. So Dennis is just there in a paddock um, with a number of different auto samplers that we can use. Um, and these will basically be set to automatically take samples at different schedules and different intervals. Um, and then we can take those samples and send them off to a lab for detailed analysis. So Next slide. Just out of curiosity, yeah. how far away are you from getting a sampler that can actually just send that data to your lot? Is that something that you are aiming to I understand that you know your workforce. It's always hard for us to try and mm -hmm. get the right time. It's raining, mm -hmm. it's wet, yeah. it's difficult to get into some of these areas. Is there a possibility is that happening in the future? Yeah. So the real-time water quality sensors, um, if they're hooked up with a modem and you've got 
decent um, internet connectivity via the um, Pelstra network or otherwise, then yes, they can... There's a problem, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. They, they can log um, all of their readings, but also they can send that in real time um, and we can access that remotely. Um, that's probably the only one at the moment that has that capability and those sensors are only able to, um, to read for nitrate, nitrogen and turbidity. Um, you can hook them up to various other sensors like height sensors, um, electrical conductivity. So you, you can if they're hooked up to a um, to a logger and a modem. So if it's complicated, then you then have to have batteries and power supplies and all that kind of stuff. Um, the Sandemus flumes and height loggers, we are currently looking at um, height loggers with telemetry so that we can also um, have a look at what's going on there remotely. And same with the auto samplers. Again, they can be hooked up with telemetry. At the moment, we go and download the data and collect the samples manually. Um, those ones where they collect samples, the samples do have to be collected promptly and then sent off to a lab. We don't have probes within those sample jars that can do a, a real-time readout. So um, the sampling equipment is constantly evolving yeah. and improving. Um, and there's, you know, this, you really have to choose what's fit for purpose for individual locations and situations and what parameters that you're wanting to, um, to monitor for. So what would be the cost of one of the high-end samplers, for example, have you got an idea? So with one of those ISCO samplers um, hooked up with full telemetry, you're talking $20,000 per unit. Per sample. Um, well, that's per, per unit. Per yeah. unit. Yeah. Um, so that will only sample, you know, one tiny section in the paddock, it might be, you know, a couple of furrows, um, but that would only be that one treatment. So if you're wanting to replicate across the paddock, you're talking about big bucks. Um, if you use a KP sampler, um, much, much cheaper units, um, but yeah, obviously don't have the degree of capability that an ISCO does. Yep. Um, and likewise, you know, obviously taking a grab sample at one point in time with a pole, is has a very very different purpose and degree of rigor than having a real time water quality sensor in that same water stream, which there is one there. That's that PVC pipe. We're just taking a validation sample there. Um, so yeah, it's really um, horses for courses. What's fit for purpose? What you can afford, and also what the um, the end end user of the data is as well. Um, I guess the important thing for us is when we're working with growers, growers want that data as soon as possible. They don't want to wait um, enormous amounts of time for that data to be number crunched and analysed and come back to them. They really need that data often as quickly as straight after an irrigation event so it can inform their next irrigation event. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll just give a quick overview of the catchment scale monitoring. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but essentially we're monitoring more than 20 different sites across the lower vertica. And the idea is to better understand the water quality in each catchment over time and how it responds to external influences. So that might be different land uses and different parts of the catchment and also over time. So obviously weather and climatic conditions have a really big impact on the water quality. Um, so we have these monitoring points all across the catchment. Um, the green ones um, are basically in the upper catchment. One of them there you can see up um, near Dalbeg, above Dalbeg, um, you know, that's to pick up um, the water, the baseline levels of the water line before it then starts to be influenced by the more intensive um, agricultural and irrigated agriculture in the lower vertican. It obviously still picks up the grazing lands. Um, and then as we move down the catchment there, we have a whole bunch of sub catchments that we're monitoring. Um, we use different types of equipment in those. Uh, some of them we just take grab samples during rainfall events and baseline samples. Some we have auto samplers um, so that when an event is triggered, they'll be taking a whole bunch of samples um, at set time intervals. And then other ones have those real time probes that are actually placed within the water body and they're taking um, taking a reading at a set interval. So it's quite intensive, um, the catchment and subcatchment monitoring across the Burdekin, but that really complements nicely some of the paddock scale stuff that we do as well. Next slide. So paddock scale monitoring um, is what I thought of call the micro scale monitoring. What we do here, we've got a, um, a trial plan there on the slide. Um, we might take one particular block and we might split it up um, into a whole bunch of different treatments. In this particular instance here, it's set up by irrigation set. Each irrigation set has 60 rows in it. Um, and then what we've done here is we have a control or a baseline or, or a grower standard practice treatment 
versus a change practice. Um, and then we replicate that across the paddock so that we're not just doing it um, in two areas, we'll then replicate those different treatments across the paddock. And the idea of replication is to try to um, reduce some of the data noise. So when you're monitoring in the natural environment, you're always going to get fluctuations. You're going to get different influences um, within each of those 60 rows. There's massive variation. So if you can replicate that across the field as much as possible, you can then have multiple data points and you can start to reduce some of those sort of um, outliers or highs and lows. So it's important to try to replicate where possible. Um, in practice, it is very difficult. Um, it's an impost to the grower when we have different treatments side by side, but it's in the same block and they might have to manipulate their irrigation or their fertilizer or chemical applications differently for each. Um, but it is important for that um, improved data. The other thing we do is we do the same crop stage. So that's the one block with the same crop stage. We try to monitor it across several seasons because every season is different. You might have an early wet season or a late wet season, and that's going to have a massive influence on your water quality. Um, so, yeah, the, the paddock scale monitoring is not just about putting one monitoring point in a paddock. This particular one, we actually have eight different monitoring points. So it's a very intensive um, process. Um, sorry, yeah. um, have you ever had a situation where you've had a trial in place and the growers involved, you know, actively involved, and they see the results and they just want to stop doing what they were doing and just, you know, and how do you, how do you manage that, how that could potentially affect the water quality monitoring? Yes, um, that has happened multiple times before um, where, yeah, basically a grower, we do the standard practice, we do a change practice. Once they see how much money they're saving with the change practice, they don't want to go back to doing um, strips with their standard practice anymore. They want to roll the whole lot out to an improved practice straight away. Um, and yeah, obviously for our monitoring, we really would like to see um, us monitor those different treatments across multiple years. Sometimes we have to beg, borrow and steal from them to keep them going. Um, and you know, most of the time growers understand that even though, yes, it's an impost to them or it might keep costing them a bit more money to keep doing that, they can see the value in us monitoring over those multiple years. And that gives them more confidence as well, because just you, because you see a result one year with one um, type of season or crop stage doesn't mean that's going to be the same across several. So most of the guys, even though they would really like to, they're itching to get on and and um, and improve things and, and, and save money, most of the guys do understand um, that we need to run it for a bit longer and that will give them more confidence then um, to roll out those changes, not just on that block potentially then, but then elsewhere on their on their farm as well. It makes perfect sense from a growth perspective. They see something that is potentially better and is going to improve their bottom line. Do it as soon as they can. But as as we found out, including in the project that I'm working in, we it's not a recipe for every single block on the farm. So we're doing a trial on a particular site, you know. And one of the reasons we've actually um, contracted some growers to actually stick with this is for this water quality monitoring and for the the sensors that we're putting in there, so we can pick up on these little things and make adjustments. Because we don't measure, we don't know how to make adjustments, and we don't know how to make this practice. Change. So. I think, yeah, it's really important, and I get the fact I was a grower, Steve's a grower, and, and it makes perfect sense if you see something that's going to improve your bottom line or it's going to improve your productivity, you want to try and change straight away. But we need to be able to capture the change so that we can actually sort of tease out all the data and then find how we can optimise this. So that's, I don't know what you think, Steve. I agree with you there, Terry, being involved with different projects over time, um, having that long-term data to back up the results that we're seeing. And I mean, I've in projects been involved in the past where I see the results, and, you know, I'm guilty as I want to change the whole lot. But when it comes to the trial, that's a case of um, SRA, BFMAC involved. I know the quality of the data and the collection, uh, the work that they do is, is you know, above what I've seen in the past. Um, so running that project through to the end and running it true to full is really important to me because if, like you said before, um, if the data is not correct, um, the modelling is going to be useless. So we need to get that good quality of data collected over that period of time. And that's it. It's really important to stick to the trial scopes and uh, making sure everything runs properly. So I can actually, even for myself as a grower, um, have that data for a couple of years to proof 
what I'm changing to. Um, yeah, really well, important. Alan made a really good point. The season this year is going to be completely different than next year. It is. So the results you see this year might not be the same as what we see next year or the That's year right. after that. So when we get a whole, you know, collection of data yeah. across multiple years, we start to paint a picture. We get that averaging, which yeah, it makes sense to us. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to race in and make a change after one year and then find that the next year is completely different and it works against you. I guess the other thing also with having, um, you know, a longer term project is often in that first year of running a trial, there's lots of um, teething issues and wrinkles that need to be ironed out, not only with equipment, but also with what works for that particular farm. Mm -hmm. And um, I know with, with the project we're currently working on, the irrigation project, you know, where there's a lot of experimentation there to to work out what works best for that farm. And there's sometimes a lot of pushing boundaries um, to see what's gonna work and what's not gonna work and whether we're pushing it too far. So often that first year is just about sorting out the whole system and making everything work. And then the subsequent years are where we start to get that really quality data coming through. So what's the common factor? Um, water is the driving force of a lot of our on-farm losses to the downstream environment. And it's not just about the reef, but the farm level, there's significant economic impact, impacts at stake. Um, so I'm sure Steve can um, elaborate on this, but, you know, with rising input costs, um, increasingly unpredictable weather, volatile agricultural markets, uh, minimising on-farm losses is more important than ever. So, you know, from a, from a farming perspective, from farm performance, trying to um, identify what the on-farm losses might be and, and manage them, um, is really important going into the future. And that's why every, every drop counts because water is that carrier for a lot of those losses. So if we can manage that, um, then we can help to manage a lot of those losses. If we reduce them, our nitrogen stays in the profile, goes into the port, which is yes. where we want it to, better NUE, better WE, better water use efficiency as well. There's herbicides, there's chemicals. We want them all in where we need them, which is in the paddock. So that's the whole concept of this. That's exactly right. We don't if we don't measure it, we don't really know. Yep. Just a little quick one, just a little conversation that myself and Arm and the irrigation uh, specialist at SRA basically had a conversation with the grower more recently out on the farm. And we had some irrigation specialists there as well. And we were just discussing stuff. And the whole conversation went for about an hour out on the head league. And the reason for that was because we were measuring. We weren't measuring, we'd be sitting there looking at the crop going, it looks good. But we actually discovered a bit of an issue and we were trying to work out between us, between all of us, how to work through that process and what we do next. So it is interesting. Otherwise, we'd be driving past just like every other day because we had a heap of measurements and we had some data already. We were able to work through this process and come up with the next step. So I think that's important. And that's where, you know, this data can be used as a decision making tool for growers. For me, that's the most important thing that comes out of the data that we collect is that decision-making tool. And as you say, if you don't measure, you don't know where those improvements might be able to be made. You're doing the best you can with what you've got, but there's still always some unknowns out there, yep. um, particularly with these systems that are so dynamic all the time, changing all the time in, in relation to um, external influences. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about the BIP or the Burdekin Irrigation Project. Um, and that, I guess Terry's been giving a couple of examples with that, um, that project. And Steve here is one of our um, involved farmers in that project as well. Um, so with the Burdekin Irrigation Project, we're mainly interested um, in the surface runoff volumes. So what we do with the BIP is from BIFMAX water quality monitoring perspective, uh, we're monitoring using those Sandemus flumes, um, the surface runoff coming off um, our, the block that we're monitoring. And as you saw with the previous slide that had the, um, the trial plan, you know, we've got a lot of data monitoring points in some of these blocks. So from that, we create what we call a hydrograph for each irrigation event for each location that we've got the flume in. And with those hydrographs, we can then plot when the irrigation runoff reached the end of the paddock. So the flumes are put at the end of the paddock. And we can look at how long that runoff um, occurred for. Um, we can also look at uh, the total volume of irrigation applied at the top end. So when you've got the total volume of applied um, at the top end and you've got the amount of runoff at the bottom end, you can have a look at what the total volume of runoff is and also what proportion of what was applied 
was lost to runoff. And that's really, really important to a grower because that's where they're losing money. If they're losing a large proportion of what they've put on off the bottom paddock and down to the downstream environment, you know, that's costing them money. That's, that's water, that's energy if they're pumping, that's potentially labour as well. So that's very, very important. Um, and obviously, if you're under or over irrigating your crop, then that can have um, implications to your productivity as well. It's also the nutrient pesticide and other things that they put on that might be getting washed out with that volume of water as well. Exactly, it? that's right. It, it, the water um, will mobilise not only the nutrients that are applied in the hill, but also um, pesticides and chemicals that are applied on the hill or in the furrow. So um, it's very important to know how much is, um, is coming off. And it's something that hasn't really been intensively monitored in the Burdekin before. So, you know, there has been a little bit done here and there, but by and large, um, there's been no other project in the Burdekin until this Burdekin irrigation project that intensively looked specifically at surface runoff losses as a proportion of irrigation applied. So you said there about, you know, how long it takes the runoff to actually occur. Like, as a grower, I personally had recycle pit, and I know there's a lot of growers with a lot of recycle pit. Steve, you've got some. Yeah. So, are you overly concerned that the water's running out because you're capturing it in a recycle pit? Oh, well, as a, from a grower's perspective, I've been involved in uh, irrigation scheduling in the past, um, back in the early 2000s when I started doing this, um, and I saw the benefits of, of getting irrigation scheduled correctly um, to basically improve crop growth and improve your water use efficiency. Um, now, recycle pits always been handy, and I've always had, on, on all farms had to recycle um, and use them as a form of catching that car water. But also, after doing the scheduling program, looking at what it was costing me to catch that water, um, how much nutrient was I losing, how much sediment was running at the bottom of my paddock into that pit that I had to clean out you know, from time to time, um, and looking at alternative energy sources in the future. So to me, um, reducing that runoff uh, means less water is going into that set and my sets are changing over earlier. So I'm basically utilising my water more efficiently um, and maintaining my productivity or improving. So it's, the recycle pits are handy, but um, moving forward, um, you probably want to try and use it as least as you can. I do, I do. It, it's a great tool to have at the end of the paddock. We all it's know. Another pumping cost. It's another pumping cost, another maintenance cost, and in, in the future, I'd like to see that's it. basically um, another sort of source of capturing water that I'm not losing. So they've actually got more more water available to me, but not from the end of my paddocks. Um, because yeah, it's, it's, it is, there's another cost, and when I've done the figures in the past to put one in now, I, I can't see the value in it over having a good, efficient irrigation schedule. Yeah, that, that's where I look at it from a grower's. Um, my tar water flow, um, if I can reduce the amount of tar water that comes out of my paddock, um, I'm reducing the amount of deep drainage I also have in my paddock, um, and I'm also reducing the amount of water I have to put into that set. So basically, I'm getting across my farm quicker um, and using the same amount of water um, to grow, you know, to grow my maximum crop. Well, so you're, you're ahead. Every so ahead. Every, every, every you're step. saving power. You're reducing. At, um, you know, you're reducing all the inputs that you put on your paddock that you want to remain in your paddock. And, and, I, and, it off. and I'm repumping less of that. Yeah. So it, look, it's, it's, it's a win-win all the way down if um, you get your efficiencies up mm. and reduce your tar water runoff. So yeah. whilst maintaining soakage. Oh, that's, that's it. That's it. And that's another, another measurement that we have to do. And that's, that's looking at this measurement. And I was talking to Arwen now. That's, that's what I want to see from this is I'm going to need a certain amount of tar water runoff to ensure that that last part of the block does get efficiently watered, and I do get that saturation across the rows. Um, but at which point do I need it? So you know, fine tuning that where I know I can shut my drills off at a certain time and we'll still get that soakage, but reducing the amount of tar water I have coming in the bottom end. And that's a very good point about the deep drainage as well. Um, for this project, um, you know, we're, we're monitoring the surface runoff. Monitoring uh, deep drainage is a lot more difficult and expensive, um, but if we do a full water balance on every block that we're monitoring, so we look at exactly how much has been applied, how much the crop has taken up, how much has lost the surface runoff, um, then we can estimate deep drainage losses from doing that full water balance. So that's also an important component of this vertical irrigation project. Um, and obviously, yeah, in some soil types, 
Um, there may not be as such an issue with surface runoff, but the deep drainage becomes a very big one. So um, up on the screen here, you'll see an example of a surface runoff hydrograph. Um, what's important to note here is that we have the flumes at the end of the paddock and the graph is just when the water reaches those flumes at the end of the paddock and continues to run off. So the water for this particular example here was started where the green dotted line is, the vertical green dotted line. Um, and it's 10.30 in the morning. That was 10.30 in the morning. So this was a standard 12-hour uh, set that this grower had in place. Um, started at 10.30 in the morning, stopped at about 10.30 in the evening. So the green dotted line is when the irrigation was started. The red dotted line is when the irrigation was stopped. So you can see there that that, that first block of time is the 12-hour irrigation duration. Um, the, and the, the water, we had three flumes put in side by side. They were just a couple of rows apart. And you can see that the water arrived at one of the flumes at about seven o'clock at night, the next one at eight o'clock at night, and the next one at nine o'clock at night. So even though they were quite close together um, and the inflow rates at the cups at the top end were quite similar, it still was considerable variation um, at the time it took it to reach the bottom of the paddock for each of those flumes. That's not unusual, um, depending on the soil type and the row length. Um, I think the row lengths here are about 700 metres. And the inflow. 600? And the inflow has a lot to do with it. The inflow has a lot to do with it, but at this particular site, we measured the inflows and they were quite similar. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, I guess it's interesting to know the variation in the time that it took to eat, reach each flume. And I guess that's something that um, most growers naturally know here in the birding because they know they get to the bottom of the end of the paddock and not all of the furrows are through and some of them are here and some of them are there. And that's why it is so complex getting it right, getting the switching off right, because they don't ever come through at the same time. Even with rainfall events, um, this particular block had a similar pattern to this. Um, and that's how, again, gave us that, um, that confidence that it was more to do with gradient and soil type, things like that. The other thing to note here is the three different colours, the three different heights there. So they, that's the height, the maximum height that they reached through the flume. And again, each of them was quite different. Um, I guess we don't normally see variation quite as extreme in this in, in the water heights with three flumes side by side. But again, it just goes to show you how different each of these were. Um, and the one in grey was consistently coming through last and had much less water going through it. Um, and that one was actually closer to the edge of the paddock where we, um, the, the grower advised us that there was potentially more deep drainage happening at that end um, as opposed to the, the other ones, the other two that were further away. So I guess what I'm trying to get across here is, you know, when you're monitoring in the field, there is a lot of variation. Um, and that's what makes farming so complex. And, you know, I don't have to tell farmers that at all. They all deal with this day in and day out. It's not a simple process. Um, up at the top there, you'll see a red uh, horizontal line. That, that's the runoff duration. So the, the runoff, you know, arrived at the first flume at, at seven o'clock, then eight o'clock, nine o'clock, the other flumes. You can see where it peaked um, at around about 11 p.m. midnight. Uh, then by about 3.30 a.m. in the morning, it had pretty much dropped off. So he turned the water off at 10.30 in the evening it didn't really stop flying through the flumes or at least declined considerably until three o'clock um, in the morning. And then it just continued at a very low level. So this is just to give you an example of what, you know, a hydrograph typically looks like, because in the subsequent slides, I'm gonna give you some real examples um, from our Burdick and Irrigation project um, at how the guys could then experiment with that red dotted line, which is the switch off time and bringing that forward earlier. So in this example, you know, the water had already reached the end of the paddock, at least where those flumes were before he turned it off. Um, so then we can start to experiment because you can see that, you know, it kept going for quite a few hours after he turned it off. So can he bring that stop time forward and still be confident that the water is going to reach the end of the paddock? And as Steve said, get that soakage that's required into the hill for the cane. This has been one of the tools that we've used in the bit in the bird and irrigation project and it's been one of the tools that the growers have been really really excited about because it's information that you've been able to gather and quite quickly to be able to get that information back and especially in our um, demonstration sites we found this information absolutely critical so it, it's not the be all and end all, but it's a really important part of the, the whole process we need to have this start stop type information to be able to optimize going forward 
That's exactly right. Because, you know, really, the grower gets out there at 10.30 at night, turns it off, but he's not there to see how long that water keeps running for and how much he's actually losing after he's switched it off. So um, it's a really important tool. And, yeah, we've had a lot of growers getting quite excited through the project. Uh, once we give them their baseline information, then they can start experimenting with different things. And we can get them these hydrographs, you know, sometimes within a couple of days or a week after that irrigation event. They can have a look at it, interrogate it, think about how they want to make a change. And then the next irrigation event, we can capture that change for them. Mm -hmm and they can um, play around with it. So it is proving to be very, very useful information. So what I've got here is an example. Um, this is one of the participating farms in the BIP project. This is a briar example. So with this particular block there in mind, um, that it was a typical briar block in that it had quite long row lengths. These were 1,400 metre drill lengths. Um, and this particular um, situation had quite high inflows. So it was about 3.5, 3.7 litres per second um, inflows. He had a couple of pumps running um, that could get in there and he needed those inflows, obviously, to get down those long drills. But um, just bear that in mind because we will give a delta example and obviously the delta example will be quite different. With this briar example, um, th this particular grower was transitioning to automation. So he didn't start with automation. He was starting with standard practice, which was manual control, 24-hour operation. Uh, so he would start it at 6 o'clock in the morning and turn it off 6 o'clock the following morning. Um, and then as he transitioned to automation, um, he could remotely turn off his water earlier and earlier. So, um, you know, running that um, standard practice, um, it was very difficult for him, obviously, to get out there any earlier than 6 a.m. the following morning to turn that water off. But as he transitioned to automation, he was able to then turn it off at 3 a.m. and 1 a.m. Um, and that had quite a significant impact um, on his proportion loss to runoff, as you can see in the table there. Um, it's not, I'm not surprised to see the 24-hour number. As a previous grower, 24 hour works really mm -hmm. nice. 12 yeah. hours also works really nice. Mm -hmm. And you know, you do that to fit around everything else you're trying to do. So I completely understand why to see that number there. Because you'd think, you know, irrigation just doesn't happen to be on 24 hour time set. It's through 23 hours, 20 hours, whatever, 18 hours. And yeah, you're picking that up. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it is, it's important that, you know, everyone's busy. You're trying to do tractor work and harvesting and all that sort of stuff. But these numbers actually, are there because that's the grower who chooses that number because he knows there's something left he has to think about. Start at seven in the morning, turn it off at seven in the morning. Particularly so. when you've got staff. Exactly. And they're doing that and then they have a schedule and then they know exactly what they've got to do to get around the farm within the time that they've got. So it's not unusual to see that. As that's well, right. So. Yeah, particularly with the briar, the larger briar farms. So yeah, for this one stand practice 24 hour manual control, uh, we worked out that Basically, the shutoff timing was nine hours after it reached one of the flumes and five hours after it reached the other flume. So this was another example where there was considerable variation in the time it took to get to each flume. Um, but yeah, it was running for quite a long time before that 24 hours was up and they could turn it off. And the proportion loss to runoff was 25%. As he then tightened things up with the um, enabling uh, mechanism of automation or the remote shut off, he could then play around with turning it off sooner and sooner. So the second example there, he tightened things up, he turned it off two and three hours after it reached the flumes and that dropped him down to 11.5% runoff. Um, so he basically halved it just by bringing forward that shut off time. And then by bringing that forward even further, um, he could get that all the way down to 5% losses. So what happened there was he was then running a 15 hour set instead of a 24 hour set. And he played around with turning the water off before it reached the flumes. And he could do this. It was, you know, 1.30 a.m. He could do that with a remote shutoff. Um, and also at this site, because he had such long drill lengths, after he turned the water off, it would run sometimes for up to seven or eight hours after he turned it off. So he was pretty confident he could turn it off before it even reached those flumes. It would still get to the bottom end. And so what you'll see with the hydrograph at the top is just where the dotted red line is. And the first example you know, that the water was running for quite some time till he turned it off. The second example you can see, which is the bottom um, the bottom line on the table, he's turned it off right at the time it's reached one of the flumes and well before it's reached the second flume and it still got through. So that's significant savings for this particular grower in power costs because he's running three pumps. 
water costs because he's buying the water from Sunwater and also labour because prior to that he had to send his staff around several times to check whether the water was through before he could shut it off. He can get through his farm. As Steve said, he can get around his whole farm a lot quicker now. Um, so if he's got hiccups, it's not going to throw his whole schedule out. It also frees up time for that person that he has employed to do other things other than go and chase that up. So he has to go and check it. We're not saying you don't do that, but he can actually free up some time to go and run around and do some other stuff, maybe some other paddocks that aren't good or That's exactly right. I see a lot more headlands getting slashed now. <laughs> <laughs> They've got time to do that. <laughs> All right. Um, we might just move on to the Delta example now. So with the Delta example, um, this farm, the row length was 380 metres and the inflow was uh, a little bit under one litre per second coming out of a ball pump. So with this particular one, it was entirely manual. This grower was not had transitioning to automation um, or any kind of sort of technology at this point in time. So we just played around with the manual control. So his standard practice was an eight hour set. Um, and he turned it off, you'll see in that first hydrograph there, he's, he's turned it off about three, three and a half hours after it's reached the plumes and it's continued to run for some time after. And his proportion loss to runoff was 18%. When he brought that shutoff time a little bit closer, um, it was between one and one and a half hours after it reached the plumes. Um, then he reduced his losses down to 8% and um, his set time was down to five hours instead of eight hours. So. I guess this is showing that even with a Delta farm and even with manual control, um, this guy was watering in the daytime. He had the luxury of watering in the daytime so he could manually change around. Um, yeah, he could still achieve significant savings. This particular um, site had slightly heavier soil than you might see in other areas of the Delta. So that's why he still had a decent proportion of lost runoff. But yeah, it, it is a fallacy to say that Delta farms have no runoff. Um, because we've had a couple now that we've monitored that have had, you know, 18%, 20 22% um, runoff. So it can, uh, this project is helping Delta farmers as well as Briar farmers. A huge energy savings right there. Yes, with his bore pump. Mm. Absolutely. Yep. And again, because he likes to water in the daytime, he can get around his farm quicker and it's a whole lot easier. We'll move on to the next one. So this is the final slide. Um, a lot of the points that I put here were actually raised by participating growers. So what we're doing with this particular project is we're providing current, locally relevant, robust data to, to support growers and their decision making. And as Terry alluded to before, you know, we're, we're all about improving productivity. So we're reducing in, uh, growth impacts from overwatering or underwatering. So that through this project, because a lot of the, these kind of measurements have not been made before, we've not only identified overwatering, but we've also identified some areas that are underwatering. And again, that's going to have a productivity um, implication. So again, this is where the measurement is so important. Um, we reduce fertiliser and chemical losses in runoff um, and also waterlogging and denitrification. Um, we reduce input costs, as we've already talked about there. We reduce downstream environmental impacts. Um, we have less surface water volumes going into the, into the lagoons, um, less deep drainage, reduced chemical and nutrient loads. And one of the growers also um, advised that one of the big in, uh, improvements or um, one of the big impacts he saw from being part of the project was improving public perception of his farm management. So less surface runoff coming to his paddocks, visible to the general paddock, public traveling past. And that was a that kind of left field. I, I personally had never thought of that as being an aspect, but he said that was a really important driver um, and benefit to him from being involved in this project. It was obviously concerning him as a grower seeing it and trying to work out a solution. How, how can I fix this problem? That's right. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I hadn't sort of crossed my mind, but it was an important driver for him. And I think that it, increasingly that sort of social responsibility and public perception is weighing on, on growers' minds. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, it is, it is. It's the sun we live in all the time. It's a social license to farm. Um, this is becoming a big issue uh, right across the industry now. Yeah. Um, yeah, the perception of that um, water's going to waste is um, we're impacting environmental issues. Um, yeah, it's, it's something we, we've taken on seriously and, and trying to do our best to sort of prevent that from happening. So, yeah. yeah, very interesting. Um, additional unforeseen benefit from my perspective to, yeah. the, to being part of the whole project. Yeah. So that, that's all from me.
Thanks, Alan. Terry almost got his wish for a 55 minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's easy to ask questions for you. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good follow. question. Um, I guess I'm going to jump in feet first with a question around, uh, I guess, scalability of all this. So, water quality monitoring, we've just seen an awesome presentation that really outlines how valuable it is to the growers who are participating, um, uh, obviously, to the projects to help. You know, validate that the projects are on track and achieving the outcomes that they're trying to achieve. Where does it, where does it become unsustainable in terms of? Does, do, do we need to do this on every single farm to validate every? You know, to, do we need to provide this level of support to every single farm to be able to make these decisions, or is, or is this where modelling starts to come in? If we get, if we build a strong body of evidence, will that help us? How, how can we make? How can we scale this up in a way that's you know, everyone's still going to have confidence in the outcome. I think, I think it's multiple approaches, Rob. I don't think we can just sort of lay our hat on one, one particular approach. I think the demonstration sites are a really key part of this whole, you know, the project and what we're trying to do. If we can bring people to the demonstration sites and they can see what we've been able to achieve and then go back to their own farms and bring one of their service providers and, or, you know, maybe hook up with Owen and capture one of their blocks gives them an idea about how to do it. I said before, it's not a recipe for every block. We understand that, but if you start to see the, the processes in place, and you start to see, oh, well, maybe it just makes people think, maybe it's a discussion. Yes, the modeling can also help as well. We, clearly, if we can turn around specific soil types, not gonna be 100% perfect, as we know models aren't. We've got a specific soil type that we know that this practice works. Why wouldn't you try it? So clearly, the inclusion of the demonstration sites is a really important part. It's, it's, it's looking at what you can do on your farm. I mean, I know from my shop, personally on, on my main farm, um, where the demonstration site is, um, it's, it's, it's a different kettle of fish to the one I manage on my mother's farm. Um, the practice that I do there will, in a sense, be different to what I'm doing over on the other farm because there's shorter like row lengths, even drills, um, a couple of different water sources. Um, so it's it's a different management and different soil type. Uh, it's it's one of those things of, of looking at modelling the data. And how can I implement that into my system and into my business plan? Um, so yeah, it's 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 not it's not going to canvas all of it, but it's going to give us the information we need to sort of look at where we can start on our own properties and, and on our own different blocks, it's depending on what what yeah. restraints there are. And that's one of the reasons the demonstration sites in itself, we've got three demonstration sites current. And one of the, the reasons behind that was to have them in different soil types with different water sources. And we actually have that. We have one at Washington Lagoon, yours, uh, one up in Clare in the Bri, and one in the Delta. So the idea is to try and capture that whole different type scenarios, different pumps, different, we've got a gravity system, we've got the cycle pit water. So every single one of these sites, which I will tell you are not easy to find, because it's very difficult to find outlets that line up 60 rows apart, all that sort of stuff. Similar types, soil types that we're looking for to be able to replicate and then have the pumping capacity to be able to change flows because we're talking about a flow of a litre a second to something like Arwen just said 3.6 litres a second hmm. or even more. Cotton have been doing this for a few years now, so they're starting to understand down there. It's really important. And I picked up on something Arwen said before about the rows not coming through evenly something we've already picked up within the project by increasing our flows we're getting a lot more even distribution of the rows coming through so that on in itself is really really good and because there's, there's nothing worse than sitting there having the six rows that don't come through and you're waiting for another six hours all that water's running out everyone it happens to everybody but it, but it gives us information as a grow so in, in past projects we, we found that we have uneven rows um, and then we looked at Hill profile exactly. um, and, and in the following year, as part of the project, we went through and actually liked the cultivar and soil and reprofiled the hill, etc., and found we had better flow in the water, better mm -hmm. more even distribution. So it's 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 looking at what are what's what's limiting, you know, getting that efficiency up there. So it's it's um, yeah, like we're saying, the data. It's it's crucial to actually getting that good modelling, getting that good information out to irrigators out there and what they can do or what they can look at. The demonstration sites as well with Rob and Owen, Owen knows in particular, but we've, we've got um, these little flow meters that sit in furrow. So we're actually, as well as doing bucket and stopwatch on every single row, which we do, we've got these little bloody ultrasonic bloody little meters that we're putting in there, which are new. Um, I 
I've been able to get a company to actually, you know, sort of buy into the project. They want to they want to add value, which is re really good. We've got sensors down the road, so a couple of hundred meters is a sensor. So we know when Steve's water hits at midnight, or you know, two hundred meters down the road, and then it, and for some reason it takes four hours to get to the next two hundred meters. What's going on? So we need to we need to know all this stuff. So the technology side of things and the demonstration sites is going to be able to get us ready for expanding this out. Um, we're running drones over the top of the of the sites, looking at canopy temperature, canopy cover, um, thermal imagery, um, bulk height. Trying to work that out. You know, at the moment that's manual and that's a lot of work. I think the last site we did um, six weeks of growth measurements every single day. Excellent. So this is it's a lot of data to process, and it's not as quick and as simple as some island stuff where in two or three days or a week you can get that data back. But we process this all together and we, we paint a picture. And I do that really intensely on those demos, and guys, in particular, so you can tell the full picture um, and take them through to harvest, so we get production data. Um, that's also extremely important. Just going down this road and you know doing all these cool things, and then we you know we don't actually don't increase production or we don't have to increase production, we can keep production the same. But we want to we want to be more we want to be more efficient. We want to reduce our water and energy use as well. So I'll, I'll just interrupt very quickly to anyone who's online, if you've got a question, please drop it into the chat because we've only got about seven or eight minutes left. And um, while we keep continuing on. Now you just said you may not increase production. Are there any signs, early signs of some production gains from some of these irrigation changes? It's too early right now in the demonstration sites, so I'm not going to put hand in hand or anything. But the measurements show that we're on a path. We're on a path. And there's been limited irrigation trials in the past. When I say limited, I only know one or so. And that particular site had increase in yields. So I'm not overly concerned about that. What we are seeing is is we're using less water and energy. Yeah. So, so scheduling yeah. correctly and it's it's not it's not so much the the, the inflow is, is more about the deep drainage and the you know, and the runoff. Um, for example, one of the demonstration sites, we increased from one litre a second, 1.7 litres a second, and now we went up to 3.6 litres a second. It's all experimentation, it's all pushing the boundaries, like Arwen said. When you start to do that, all of a sudden you're going from, if you think about it, we've gone from 30 metres, you know, uh, a, um, a minute of the water flowing to something like 80 metres a minute. So all of a sudden you've got a lot more water running down that road. We're still, we've still got the tensiometers in there, so we're still getting soakage, we're getting adequate soakage, which is what we want. But now we're going to start turning the water off way, way back before, because otherwise we're going to get a lot of runoff, and Alan's going to capture that. She's going to tell us how much we've got running off. So, um, so yeah, we have to start experimenting with that sort of stuff. Where do we put these end of road sensors? I think 20 meters up the end of the road, like 50 meters up the end of the road. That's a bit of optimization, and that may differ on everyone's farm. There's potential down the track to make that, you know, that could be a common practice down the track. And I guess importantly, all of this water quality monitoring is also going to link into the overall project, which includes economics and yield analysis, yeah. the whole lot. So you're going to get, you're going to have a really comprehensive, complete picture or complete picture of, yeah. of the farming operation and, and the water quality monitoring is going to really help, but particularly with that counting every drop. So yeah. we know what the volumes are. We can then use that to determine what the, the losses are from the paddocks, both in terms of water and all of the, and the pollutants. But we can also link that back to, well, what's it worth to save that water and apply it more, uh, more precisely and then counter that against what the costs of automation are. So you've got the full economic picture. So yeah. people can make informed decisions about automation and other practice changes in the future. Yeah, and like I said, you know, the, the BIP doesn't just talk about automation as well. We talk about soil moisture probes as, yeah. as, a, as a basic level, entry level type. You know, growers may want that. An interesting sort of, I find it interesting anyway, that the project was initially set up to look at soil moisture probes and, and there'd be hardly any uh, automation of irrigation, but we've had a complete reversal where we've found growers just want this technology. I think it's been around for eight, nine years now, and people are sort of saying, well, you know what, this is robust equipment, this stuff is working. Um, and they, they're actually taking notice of the growers who have had it for that long and thinking it's just a, a, a very smart step moving forward. Yeah, and, and, and with labour at the moment, I mean, that's part of the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, I've gone to automation on my main farm. Um, I've seen what I can do in the past through scheduling. Um, 
doing the growth measurements, et cetera, in the past. And I've sort of, sort of fallen back a few steps from where I was, um, where I've actually increased my irrigation times per set because I just can't get around doing it. So it's one of those things I've gone to a convenient time or set times on the pump, which means my irrigation um, run for that sort of week or whatever will actually expand out and may even overlap and continue on. So I'm not getting the productivity I was getting before, um, but I'm still using the same method. So by going to be part of this project where I can actually identify more areas where I can get more efficient and coupling that with the automation um, and the row sensors, um, I feel and I do strongly believe that I will get back up to um, increase my productivity where, to where I know I can actually achieve it um, while maintaining that high water use efficiency and retaining what we're saying. Where, we're looking at what is being lost out of the paddock. I'm looking at what I can retain in the paddock. Because I've applied it, I want it to stay there mm -hmm. um, because that's where we're going to get the benefit from it. Um, Seeing it down the drain and putting it through my recycle pump, it's just another cost now. Um, so while I can retain everything in the paddock, uh, as much as I can, it's a great benefit to me. And you get to sleep through nights? Because I sleep through nights, yes, and um, the little, little, little bits we've done with the automation so far where we've set up in row sensors where we had a set for a little I know that paddock to get um, good infiltration rate and get the, the rows all through evenly. It was about 10 hours. Um, uh, it was 10 to 12 hours, so we set it on 10 hours. So we put the end row sensors up the paddock. Um, they triggered off and changed it over in that um, I was sort of, I think we saved something like three hours. So they hit the sensors early now. We still had tail water coming out. So um, fortunately, we've had rain one way or the other. It's fortunate, unfortunate. Um, I haven't actually irrigated that block again, but I went through because we had to spray. We removed the sensors. I've actually put the sensors further up the paddock now to see if that is more of a trigger point or calculate where the trigger point is going to be to actually change that set over. Steve, um, Steve may have just answered the question that you asked before about how we get this to spread out further and how we get growers. You're basically optimising your own farm. You're okay, actually, yeah. you're using using some specialist people to help you, but Plain, at the same yes. time, yeah. you're optimising your and own. And that's the outside of the project. It's like you're talking about is it's outside of the project. Outside of, and, and Lee, that I mean, we'll talk about the other time I managed as well. Um, that's in, in front of mind for next year to actually look at automating that and, and doing what we can. I mean, and look, over the years, I've, I've watched Fast Guys, you know, um, do uh, with the automation setup and always look at that. Oh, I've got time to run around and do it while I've had a meeting for it, et cetera. And now I look at the fact that I'm, um, I'll do it on my own. I can actually do this on my own because this frees me up. I'm not out at night time spraying because I use a contractor. Um, I can actually get around and do other things and concentrate on, on, on the farm work that needs to be done because during the night I'm not chasing water. Um, I'm not heading out there at 10, 11 o'clock at night to change it. over and be back there at 6 in the morning or 5 in the morning. depends on when I have to change it. Um, it's gonna, you're going to have breakfast. Thank oh, it, it, it changes on time and it's, it's sticking to that schedule. Because once, once the schedules are set up, it's sticking to it. So I'm getting my water through when it should be and applied at the right time. So just, just sorry, just picked up on something there. So you said he saved three hours. How many sets have you got across that paddock? Across that paddock, there's six sets across that paddock. So if you could save three hours on each set, there's 18 hours of irrigation. And look, once we um, get the irrigation in, look at fine tune, it may even be more than that. So you could save a day quickly. It is, the, which is the money in your pocket. It's money in my pocket and it's, it's maintaining the right stuff. So, yeah. yeah look, it's, it's, yeah, the way, the way, why I'm looking forward to this year, it's savings and getting more efficient. And, and like others have said to me, you know, looking at putting alternative power sources on, so until I can actually identify where that's going to get me the best benefit, there's no point in doing any kind of alternative power until I know where I'm going to get the best bang for me, but like it, it's you know, where I'm actually going to increase my efficiencies and, and, and save money and, and you know, use the water efficiently. There. And then you'll be able to design a system for power that's going to be fit for purpose. And exactly. Only not over designed because you were using too much energy or whatever. Yeah, and, and putting the alternative in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. you know, so, like I was saying with the recovery pit, um, over, over the years it's probably been my biggest energy user um, because it's not only my water is catching, it's also it's catching overflows from some water channel in neighbour's water. Um, I'd like to see that to be one of the um, alternative pumping sources that's coming in, not a major source that I'm using because it's available. Um, so if my water, um, tail water running into there is reduced, um, the pumping time is going to reduce on that pump. So it's, 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 hopefully it'll be one of my um, lesser power users. Okay. Excellent. All right, well, we're almost out of time and we haven't actually received any questions through the chat and I can't see any hands up. So 
guess does anyone got anything else that you feel is important to add? That's where you want. Well, from from Grub's perspective, keep an eye in mind. Um, have a look at the projects that are going on um, and see what you can adapt on your farm to this. Um, like we said, it's not these um, these sites on the project, it's what we get back from data may not suit what you're doing, but it's going to give you an idea of what you can look at and where you can improve. So yeah, keep an eye in mind and have a look at the data that's coming into this. Look, and just from a from a lead perspective on the project, I can't thank Arwen and Steve enough and yourself managing the project. Um, it's a really good project and very proud of what we've been able to achieve so far. I've got a long way to go yet. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be really exciting to see the data coming mm. out of it. We've got uh, school children coming up to look at these demonstration sites in the future, uh, which is really good. The young kids need to understand that, you know, without water, these places don't exist. We don't have food to eat. All of these things, it's, it's, a, it's a really important stepping process. And I think the demonstration sites, the project itself, the bar one's doing, it all connects together. It works really well. Mm, I absolutely agree. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the project, well, this wasn't meant to be a BIP session. This was about one no, volume. No, it's been, been, a, yeah. been a, uh, uh, you know, a, a strong feature, and it's probably important to acknowledge that the, the BIP project is a consortium of organisations yes. who are all working together really well, um, and also that it's funded through the, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, through the Reef Trust Partnership. So I think, you know, in reality, it's an, it's a... Um, it's a, a, a really effective use of that investment. It's doing really good things. I think Steve would agree that yeah, it's that providing you a really good level of service. It is, it is. I mean, the, the data I'm going to get from this, that from a decision maker, is going to be absolutely brilliant. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, one and all, for um, participating and contributing to this morning. It's been awesome. I've really enjoyed today's session. It's been um, a, a real pleasure to hear about the work that's going on and, and, and to hear firsthand how effective it's been. So, and thank you to everyone uh, online for joining us. Um, thanks again, and I hope you all have an enjoyable rest of the day. Cheers. Thanks, Rob, and thank you, John Roberts, for having us. No problem. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob.